Hi, Erin. Hello, Trisha. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here today. This is a little bit different from what I usually do. I usually host fiction authors, but you have a special message and I couldn't wait to share it with my fans and listeners. So do you want to just jump right in and tell us your story and why you're here today? Absolutely. So my name is Erin Barrett, as she mentioned, and I am the author of the book From Beaten to Badass and My Journey of Broken Blessings and How I Became My Own Hero. Um, it's a pretty intense title and a lot of people kind of get thrown off by the beaten and then the badass and they want to know more. And it's really my life story from when I was born all the way until I was um, 36 years old, which obviously I'm still here. I'm 39. So <laughs> I'm still alive. Um, but it's the really pivotal moments in my life. So it really dives into me as a child growing up as a twin. I have a twin sister and her and I really are completely opposite. I was, I was shy. I was skinny and scrawny. I had buck teeth. I was bullied. I was teased as a child. And she was like the popular one, the pretty one, the one that everybody um, wanted to hang out with. She was outgoing and I just kept getting more shy and more shy. But if you knew me today, you would be like, you shy? No way. (laughs) Yeah. And so, um, it talks about my life as a child and how I really, um, felt as a child being bullied and I was abandoned, uh, in my life by my mother at, at one point. And then I talk about my love for golf and then the whole premise around the beaten to badass really shows, um, my relationship with, a monster. I call him the monster. I don't give him any credit other than that, um, where he beat me and he raped me. And how did I get out of that? And then there's a lot of other traumas that happened in my life, but I really wanted to give, you know, the reader, the full picture. I just, I didn't want my book just to be about abuse. I wanted it to be about everything that beat me down that led me to be a badass and become my own hero. Because I think a lot of times people just focus on that one tipping point or that one moment, and they don't focus on the before and the after, because, you know, it's like, the fairy tale of Disneyland, right? You see the before, you see the fairy tale, and then it's supposed to be happily ever after. But sometimes there's not happily ever after. There's some other traumas that happen. So I really wanted to give my readers the whole picture. And I really think I did that with this book. That's very cool. I think that's so important too, because nothing happens in a vacuum. Like people don't understand why someone may go through that experience and may kind of live with that experience in domestic violence and abuse for a period of time, but there are factors that can lead up to being in that place and experiencing that and not being able to get yourself out maybe as quickly as some other people would be like, well, it's obvious. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know if you know my experience as well. I was anorexic and when I went to write about that experience, I didn't write nonfiction. I wrote a fictionalized account, but I couldn't just write one book. Like a lot of people were like, I want this wrapped up in one book. I'm like, no, it's it's a life story. It's it's my psyche, my belief system and what led me here and my whole journey of recovery, which I can imagine is tell me more about that. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I, as a child had nightmares, I had night terrors and I would wake up in the middle of the night and just scream and cry. Um, and so my parents immediately put me into therapy in third grade. And so, you know, when you get picked up from school early, people start to ask you like, why are you leaving early or what's going on? And so (laughs) my, therapist was kind of scary. Um, and he talked like a vampire. And so I would tell people that I was going to learn how to talk like a vampire because I was being bullied and teased anyway. So why would I tell them the truth of going to see someone? I didn't want them to know about that. So, um, I remember, you know, sitting in therapy on a couch, he always had this couch. And then he would sit in this big leather chair with a yellow pad of paper and take notes and just ask me like the most weirdest questions ever. And so my, my beginning days of therapy was not (laughs) like the most pleasant experience. And then as I got older and things kept happening and the abandonment happened. And I mean, I went to four different, I went to three different eighth grades and four different high schools. I had been on my own since I was 14, pretty much. And so needing to talk to somebody or whatnot um, was my way out of being able to express myself and not have to, because I didn't have any friends. I, I mean, teachers were my friends. And so I started, you know, seeking counseling in school and writing and um, journaling, because my dad was like, always journal if you have any, you know, issues and stuff. And so really journaling and writing was a, a healing factor for me um, and talking to people that were adults. So I got along with the adults. I never got along with the kids. And um, 
when I had to write my book, I remember there was moments of when I had to tell my story it was those moments that were going to be hard to tell because I had to relive it, such as, you know, the abuse and the rape. I was like, oh, I think I'll just work on this chapter instead. <laughs> You know, I would, I'd kind of put it off. And I remember one time I was like, all right, Aaron, in order to get this book done, you have to get chapter three done, which is the tipping point of abuse. And I don't know about you, um, but for me, I had a court case with, with, with my abuse. And so I had, I had the records. I knew exactly where they were um, in my house. So when I had to get to that dirty stuff, I had to get to the stuff that people were like, oh my God, I don't know if I want to hear about this. I remember, um, getting up off my desk or off my desk. I was not on my desk, <laughs> my chair, getting out of my chair, walking down to the basement into the right where the bag was with the police records and all of the stuff that contained um, around this abuse. So I could make sure that I was telling it truthfully. And it was hard, you know, cause I had to sit there and I had to sit in, I had to sit in the filth and I had to sit in the hard stuff and I had to sit with me alone in my office and dive into it with the little girl, right? The child within us that we we're like, I am so sorry that I wasn't there to protect you and you protected us. Like you had to grow up and you had to be the one to protect us. And you didn't get to be that child. I mean, yes, the abuse happened in my twenties, but come on, we're really children in our twenties. <laughs> we're not really adults. Um, but I had grown up so fast at 14. So that little child, I mean, really had to kind of just keep pushing through. And so when I had to write that hard stuff, I had to sit with that little girl and I had to let her tell her side to me. And it was hard to hear, you know, it's really hard to go into that person and say, Hey, how I didn't know. I'm really sorry. It's not like I intentionally wanted to be abused or I wanted to be raped or, you know, go through all the traumas I went through. So for me, um, counseling was, was huge and having a good support system was huge. You know, my husband's amazing. My father's amazing and really just writing it out and, and letting the tears fall where they may, you know, and not holding that back. And I think a lot of us, when we have traumas, we kind of just put the blinders on and we just keep on focusing ahead. And we're like, Hey, we're okay. We're okay. We're okay. And then it does catch up with us. And so finally I was able to release all that with my writing. Do, do you think that's why you end up writing a book is because your father always said, write it out. And that was sort of a natural talent or national meaning for you. I really never thought I'd ever write a book. Funny, funny thing is, is growing up, I was told I was a horrible writer. I had horrible grammar. I had to go to speech class uh, for six years for my S's and my Z's because I had really buck teeth. People called me Mr. Ed, like the horse, you know, if, <laughs> if you're my age or, or older, you know what that is. Um, and so I was teasing and I never, you know, never thought I had grammar. I was always like, oh, I'm poor at grammar. I'm poor at spelling. I'm, I have a, you know, poor, poor, poor. I kept um, saying I wasn't good enough at that because I was taught that I wasn't good enough. And so writing to me was just a way of expressing myself for myself and not for anybody else. But my dad would journal and he would write all the time on um, yellow pads of paper, which is interesting because that therapist I first had had a yellow pad, but I just found it very therapeutic. And so when I decided to write my book, it wasn't something um, that I thought about really two years prior to 2019 is when the um, Me Too movement started and people were shaming women for coming forward, even if it had been weeks or days or years or months or whatever the time frame was, they were shaming all these women and they were very adamant about doing it on social media and out in the media. I just got so mad about it. I was like, wait a minute, I'm a survivor of domestic violence and sexual assault and I'm staying silent while all these people are bashing all these women. So I went live on Facebook. It was one of the bravest moments of my life live on Facebook. And I said, you know, I'm really pissed off and I'm really tired of people bashing these women for being so brave. And that's when I actually finally spoke my truth because I had kept it silent for seven, eight years. I didn't tell anybody except for, you know, those that were closest to me. And I said, me too. You know, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And I said, you know, we're not defined by our circumstances. We are a badass. We just have to get back up. And so that kind of planted a seed in my brain. I said, you know, maybe one day I will tell my story. Maybe I will write a book one day. Didn't really think I would. And then two years fast forward, God was like, hey, remember that promise you made like two years ago? I was like, oh no, <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, and he was like, it's time. So it, it took me five months with three weeks off to write my book. I mean, it was all in me. And that's what I tell people. I said, if you have a story, which we all do, and you want to write and share, um, you need to do that because your story might not, your, what you went through isn't necessarily for you. It might be for somebody else. And so I feel that all the stuff that I've gone through, whether it was being raped, 
uh, beaten, nearly killed, abandoned, abused, broken, whatever it may be, it's because I was supposed to be the person to step up and speak up and be that voice to give others um, kind of a path to, hey, you know, you're not alone. You're not defined by this. And I just think it's so important um, that we do tell our stories. And I never really wanted to write a book. I never considered myself an author because I was told that I was horrible at writing. And it's funny because when I was writing my book, my ex-stepfather sent me a journal that I put together of like different things from my teachers. And I looked back at it and it was right as I was writing my book. And it said, she's a phenomenal storyteller. She's amazing at writing. She's got beautiful hand. And I was like, what? I had this belief system for who knows how long because people were telling me one thing when really the truth was actually written, <laughs> you know, it was in stone per se. Um, so now I'm like, hey, I am an author and I claim that and I'm a good writer. And I don't know about you, but I'm sure when you write your books, you go back and read it like, oh, who wrote that? That's pretty good. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I mean, writing my book was never something I thought I was going to do, but it turned out to be one of the best things I did. I will have to say, I admire you so much. And yes, that was super brave to just get on Facebook and say, guys, look, listen, me too. And you need to respect these people. Um, and I think I made the slip in front of you one time and accidentally entitled your book, Broken to Badass. And you were like, people do it all the time. All not the time. broken, not broken, beaten, but badass still. So I admire you so much. And I love, and I know your story, but um, I want other you to tell our listeners um, how you get your books out there because it's so unique and so inspiring to me. Yes, I, um, so I've gone through a lot of loss, a lot of trauma. And some of my story is about my infertility journey. Um, and I actually talk about my first loss in my book in one of the um main main chapters about how I lost my first pregnancy and I had to have surgery and all of these things. And um, I was I was on top of the world. So my book came out in October of 2019. I was on top of the world. I was on the news about my book during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I was on stages and all everything was going great. I had several pre-orders before my book launched. People were supporting it. I was like, this is so badass. <laughs> This is wonderful. Everybody's buying my book. My story is getting out there. I hope it's helping people. I hope it's educating people, inspiring people that, you know, they're not alone, regardless of what they've been through. And I didn't know it at the time because my husband and I had taken a break from our infertility journey. I was like, I don't want to do all the tracking and all of this. And we actually got pregnant and we had no, no idea. And on December 8th of 2019, there was an explosion in my lower pelvic region. And I was like, we don't have the money. We can't go to the hospital. Um, let's just, you know, wait till the morning and figure it out. Well, come to find out we were pregnant and we were about three months along and I was losing the baby and I was, I was going to die <laughs> if I didn't have surgery immediately. So I had life saving emergency uh, surgery on December 8th, had to stay in the hospital overnight because I wasn't breathing. And, um, for the week of recovery, like a couple of weeks of recovery, I was feeling sorry for myself. I was like, man, I was on top of the world and you got to do this really God, you know, like, why do you have to throw this at me? Haven't I been through enough? And I was like, whoa, Aaron, this is, this is not how you look at life. Come on now. <laughs> You're better than that. So I, you know, basically pulled myself out of this pity party moment. And on December 27th, 2019, almost 20 days after the surgery, I said, you know, it's great that people are reading my book, but I need the people that need to read my message, get the book. I was like, what if, you know, I just threw a what if out there to my husband. I said, Hey honey, what if I took my book and I had people pay $25 for the book, but they don't get it. They don't, they're not buying it for them. They're sponsoring it to go to a shelter. Do you think that's crazy? And he's like, I don't see why not. Why not just throw it out on Facebook and see what happens. And so I posted it on Facebook and I said, Hey guys, I'm trying to get the book into the hands of those that need to read it most, the need to be inspired and find strength, hope, and courage within who they are, um, sponsor a book for 25 bucks and I'll send it to a shelter with your name in it. And it immediately got a hit within like a couple of hours. Um, I think I got three by the end of the year, which I found incredible since it was right after Christmas and between new years. Um, and we were able to get 500 shelters sponsored in 2020. Yeah. And we are now sitting at, so 2021 has not been that great because everybody's getting back into work and all that, but we're still making an impact. So, and so far we're at 618 shelters across the country that have been sponsored. We have 22 states that are fully sponsored, which means every shelter I was able to find in that state, find an address and vet and make sure that they're doing the things and they're still active, um, have a, have a book. So 22 states are covered completely. 
we have two books internationally and we'd be, we've been able to plant over, I believe, um, I still have to send the money in for the trees, but we've been able to plant over 70 or 80 trees in the last year um, because people have done the Make an Impact mission, um, which is really incredible because when you give a book to a shelter, you're not only saying, hey, you're not alone, but you're also telling people um, that they're going to make it through this and that you're the light in their darkness. But what's incredible is that the book gets sent to the shelter and then obviously they have to see like what is this book about is it going to be something that's triggering or not triggering so all the advocates the counselors the employees they all read it they actually fight over it i've been told several times <laughs> they're like i want to read it next no i want to read it next um so they all read it so they get the full picture of before during and after abuse which i think is really crucial and then it gets on the um, shelf of the library for the victims and survivors that are you know, seeking help and really trying to figure out their life after abuse. So it's, you give once, but you keep on giving because so many people are reading the book and being educated and inspired to understand, you know, abuse isn't something us little girls say, oh, I can't wait till I grow up. I want to be in an abusive relationship. <laughs> it's, it's not that at all. It's actually the opposite, but it doesn't happen where you just fall into abuse. There are certain things that have happened in your life you know, that lead you down that road, thinking that that's what you deserve. And I'm sure it's similar with your story in anorexia. It's not something that you just woke up one day and said, hey, I want to have this problem. I mean, I'm sure it's not that at all. I'm sure certain circumstances happened and it led you down that path. And so now you're an advocate to help others. That is so inspiring. And that's such a great model because you're right. I mean, I may not have had that experience with domestic violence and many of my listeners may not, but we can give back and we can sponsor a book to go to a shelter for those that really need to read your book and who may not have access to that. So that's, yeah, that's such a cool idea. It's so inspiring and especially for Domestic Violence Awareness Month in October, which it is now. Um, yeah, so where can someone give if they want to find you and donate the money for a book? They just head over to beaten to badass, uh, dot com, okay. and there's a big pink button that says make a difference. And you just go there and sponsor now. Um, and that that page on the website shows, you know, everybody, you know, what the mission is and how many books were, you know, how many shelters have been sent out. How, if I could talk right, <laughs> how many shelters have been sponsored? How many books have been sent to shelters? What are percentages? Because I want to hit obviously 100% in the USA and then go worldwide. Um, and then it shows every shelter that's been sponsored in every single state. So those aren't actually shelters that need to be sponsored. Those are shelters that have been sponsored. And then at the very bottom shows everybody that's ever um, donated. And so we've hit 618 over the last almost two years because 80 people have sponsored. I've got people that sponsor every single month. Yeah, I've got, I've got one person that sponsors four books a month. I have another person that sponsors one, a couple other people that sponsor one couple, you know, I had one person sponsored like 10 every single month for a while there. So really it's not just about the one, it is about the one, the one is important, but if there's ability to give more on a like monthly basis, that's where we start to really kind of get our numbers up. So that's great. That's so inspiring that people are willing to do that. I'm really yeah, inspired by everything you're doing, your organization, beatentobadass.com. People can go there. And I also know that you have a release today. Tell me about your new book. Yes, I'm so excited about this. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Mraz is my mentor, and she gathered um, 12 of us, including her, so 12 total women that have gone through some stuff, have gone through some um, traumas, but really, you know, hit the ground running and got through it with some resilience and it's called hold my crown. So it's all about, um, women supporting women and just saying, hold my crown. I got this, you know, whatever it may be. So in that book, I actually talk about more of my infertility of the second loss. I talk about my infertility loss and how that really has devastated me and what I've gone through. My chapter is finding hope amongst the loss. And so I talk about that and I'm still on that journey of infertility, um, but there's other stories about abuse, about um, murder, all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's some things that these women have gone through that are horrific that you would think would just break us and keep us down. But these women are, they're badasses. And Michelle calls us 
the queens. <laughs> so that book is coming out today that I'm really excited about. And depending on how they want to order it, um, if they want to order it from me, since I'm one of the authors, they can go to beingabadass.com and they can find it there. And, or if they know a different author in the book and they want to support them, they can go to their page and get the book from them. So it's pretty incredible, but we're really excited about it because it's going to change lives and save lives. Very cool. And is that also on ebook on Amazon? It will be. Yes. So today is the release of the Kindle version. And so if you go there, you can download it. We're hoping to hit bestseller today. So all the support would be much appreciated. So get the Kindle, get the Kindle version. And then if there's an author that you know personally or would like to support, go to their page and get the hard copy and we will sign it and ship it to you personally. Awesome. I'm definitely going to one click today to support you guys. Thank I you. Think so inspiring and impressive that you're willing to share your story to help others see that yes there is hope there is light there is a whole life out there on the other side no matter what you've been through absolutely i think that's the biggest thing is that people need to know that they're not alone you know when you're going through that darkness you're like there's there's no hope for me nobody understands what i've been through and we might not all have the same story but there is definitely a silver lining in all of our stories that are linked for sure and it's so important here, especially the past two years, people have been so isolated and it's been hard to connect with other people. I know that therapists have been jam packed. They have no more room in their schedule to see anyone. And so just getting that hope and that message out there that says, you know, hang on just one more day, call someone, call a hotline, call, call anyone, talk to someone. It's just Absolutely. so important. Yeah. And I mean, domestic violence has been on the rise through COVID really bad. And, you know, I think a lot of people know about the case that's going on with the Gabby, the Gabby situation, and they can't find this person of interest. And it's just so sad that, um, you know, people send out code messages within text message or a conversation and people are unaware of what those messages are. You know, I, I always tell people that I talk to have a code word. It could be something random. Like if I called you, Trisha, and I said, wow, the sky is purple today. You'd be like, purple? You would know something is wrong. So making sure that you have a code with, with your friends that nobody else knows what they understand is so important, especially if they know that you're being abused. I have a friend and we have a code word and she's going through a really rough divorce right now. And it's been an abusive marriage for, for years, for over a decade. And she never told me when I thought we were, you know, I was like, why didn't you tell me? You know that this is what I deal with. And she finally had the courage to tell me. And so I think, really being aware and open and telling your friends, I've got your back no matter what, I will believe everything you tell me and having that code word so we can help other women, even men, you know, get to safety. And it's just a matter, like if I called you and I started talking nonsense, you would be like, oh, something's wrong. I need to get the authorities over to her right now, you know, or I need to get over there or whatever it may be. And so I think educating people about that. And I think that was the biggest um, thing that people are talking about with the Gabby case is she talked about Stan, which happened to be her grandfather's name but she wasn't talking about stan and there's a lot of um hypotheticals of what that was looking like you know send a, send the authorities now or an eminem song that talks about how crazy some guy is about some fan or something and so i think you know talking to your girlfriends talking to your friends and really educating each other on like hey if i say this then this would what it means and it might not be abusive related it could be you know related to other traumas you know you've You've dealt with anorexia your whole life. And so if you're struggling with that, there might be a code word for that, you know, or depression or anxiety or whatever it may be. But really understanding what and how people talk to each other, I think is the biggest thing that we need to put out there. And that's really important. I had a friend who had to go to a domestic um, shelter one time, and I was just so grateful there was somewhere that she could go that was safe and she could take her daughter and both of them would be safe. And um you know, they didn't ask them questions. They just said, okay, you know, you need help. We're here. And she was able to get out of her situation and get the help she needed and the safety she needed for her and her daughter. So, and raising awareness about those shelters is equally important and letting people know there's that help and that resource. Yeah, because I know in Colorado, I'm actually, I work with a state representative and she tells me all the different things that she's working on because her two biggest passions is domestic violence, you know, advocacy for that and then advocacy for animals because they can't help themselves. Um, and she's working on having a resource 
on the Colorado government site that is specifically shows every resource possible instead of having to go to this site and then go to that site and then go to this site and having it all in one place. And I think that is so important. And so writing letters to your congressmen, to your state representatives, being involved in the town halls and letting people know like, hey, this happened to my friend or this is what I've heard. I think we can save more lives together rather than just trying to do it alone. And that's what beating a badass is all about is collaboration and getting the message out there and saying, hey, this is what I can do. What can you do? How can we collaborate? How can we bring awareness? And I always tell people, I said, we we all have a voice, but if we bring it to get together, then we're louder than ever and they can't ignore us. <laughs> That's awesome. And is it true that you've done a TEDx talk as well? No, I'm, I've tried. I've tried. Um, Michelle, Michelle Mraz, my mentor, uh, she's done a TEDx. I've applied to a TEDx. <laughs> okay. I haven't gotten there yet, but I will. One well, day. keep your fingers crossed. We know you'll get there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, again, this is Erin Bauer. Her book is Beaten to Badass, about surviving domestic and violence, bullying, and it's really about her whole life story and the beautiful life that you've become and earned and fought for yourself. And I'm just so proud to have you here on our show today. And I hope that yeah, I'm excited about your new book, Hold My Crown. Everyone can find that one today. The release is today, as well as Beaten to Badass at beatenthebadass.com, as well as Amazon. Do you have anything else for my listeners? Yeah, I do. Um, so Trisha is being humble, but there's another book coming out later this year called Keep Smiling Badass Edition, and I'm honoring her that she'll be in it. Um, so her picture will be in there with her quote, and because she's a badass. Don't let her fool you, but she is a badass. And then for your listeners also, I just want to say um, you're not defined by your circumstances. You are a badass. You just got to get back up. Very nice. Thank you so much, Erin. And yes, I'm very honored to be in your book as well. So we will definitely share that when it comes out. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's truly an honor. And you're such a wonderful woman. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you.